si vas a ir de fija en mano. No, 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 Hello. Uh, so welcome to the uh, afternoon sessions. We'll start with the multimodal session. And the first presenter will be Raul Gomez. Uh, he's a, an industrial PhD student, uh, both at Eurecat and the Computer Vision Center at uh, Autonoma of Barcelona. And he will talk about exploring hate speech detection in multimodal publications. Hello. Uh, so yeah, I'm Raul, I'm Raul Gomez, and I'm going uh, to present this work, uh, Exploring Hate Speech Detection in Multimodal Publications, uh, where multimodal publications stands for social media publications uh, formed by a text and associated image. Okay, so uh, what is hate speech? Um, there are many definitions for it, uh, but a common accepted one is this one. Um, attacks on a community based on their uh, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender, etc. And to uh, get a fast understanding of it, uh, most of the hate speech can be enclosed in one of these categories, racist, sexist, homophobia, or religious-based hate. Um, in this presentation, I'm going to show some hate speech examples because I think that openly talking about it is the only way to properly uh, fight against it. So, uh, okay, uh, what is multimodal hate speech then? Um, in some publications formed by an image and a text, uh, the image can provide valuable context uh, to understand if they are hate speech or not. And even in some cases, a joint interpretation of both modalities, the visual modality and the textual modality, is required to decide if they are hate speech. Uh, in here we have two tweets examples uh, where uh, both modalities, the text and the image by themselves, are not hate, but if you put them together, you need to jointly interpret them to decide if they are hate speech or not. Okay, so what are the motivations of this work? Uh, first, that hate speech is widespread in social media and it's even increasing in some scenarios, so for, unfortunately, and it's so, also it can lead to other types of violence. Uh, then uh, that social media nowadays is multimodal and specifically it usually combines images and text. And moreover, users tend to construct hate speech publications where the text is not enough uh, by itself to identify their hate speech. And they do that because of se several reasons. Uh, one of them is to avoid uh, content control methods and the other way to try to uh, make uh, hate seem more innocent or funny using those images. In here, uh, I show some hate racist publications I received in my own social networks recently. And I'm not in a particularly racist environment, so this is uh, daily, uh, day daily stuff. And as you see also in all those cases, you need to jointly interpret the image and the text to identify they are racist in this case. Uh, then uh, there's a huge social and also political interest in hate speech and in fighting against it. And there are many political initiative, initiatives in that sense. And finally, um, automatic hate, de hate detection uh, methods can be useful for much more than content control or censorship in social media. Uh, as an example, the European Network Against Racism uh, uses this kind of methods to track and study racist spotlights around the world. Okay, so what are the challenges of this multimodal uh, hate speech detection task? In here, we have a tweet with an image. And what's the, what's the knowledge required to interpret the image? Uh, we would need to know uh, how a map looks like, the continent shapes, or that different uh, bluish color in the Mediter Mediterranean Sea and the different text font highlights it over uh, other the, the rest of the elements on the scene. In here we have a, a tweet containing only text. Uh, and to interpret it, uh, we would need to know what humans are, what uh, animals are, or what separates means. Uh, and in here we have this multimodal uh, racist publication. Uh, and to identify this publication is uh, racist, we need to have the previous knowledge, but also much more complex knowledge. Uh, for instance, we would need to know that Europe and Africa are lands uh, where people from different ethnicities live. 
than uh, racist people in Europe use the word animals to refer to African people, which is racist, and that the separate word in the text refer to, a to an element in the image, which is uh, separating in between two elements, in this case, the highlighted element, the Mediterranean Sea. So this is a paradigmatic, paradigmatic example of how complex the multimodal hate detection, uh, hate speech detection task uh, can be. Um, okay, so to target this task, uh, we gather a data set. Uh, we gather tweets that are susceptible of containing hate speech. And to do that, we use um, uh, 50 word uh, keywords from Hatebase, which is uh, a platform that monitors um, hate speech online uh, that are very common in hate speech tweets. Uh, then uh, we keep the uh, tweets with images and filter out those that are uh, short, the ones that contain poor related words, or uh, the ones whose images contain only text. Then uh, we annotate this data using Amazon Mechanical Turk. Uh, we show the workers the hate speech definition and a few examples and ask them to uh, label them between not hate or five different hate speech categories and we level each tweet with five workers, three workers, sorry. Uh, so in here in this pie chart, we see the uh, distribution of the, over the classes, and the bars plot show the percentage of hate and not hate tweets uh, for different uh, keywords. This data set is available for download. Uh, it contains uh, 150,000 tweets, all formed by an image and a text, the raw annotations, and also uh, the text extracted from the image by the OCR. So uh, if you are, in, are interested in the task, uh, you can get the data set here in this, in this link here. Okay, so let's go to the experiments. Uh, first, we treat both modalities separately. For images, uh, we train a CNN for hate and not hate detection. And for text, uh, we use a GLOVE uh, model to encode words. Uh, this model is trained on Twitter, and we use it uh, to ensure we have representation for common Twitter slang. And we also use symbols to encode uh, common Twitter uh, interactions, such as hashtags or mentions. Uh, and then, using the tweet's text, we train an LSTM also for hate, non-hate classification. Um, this is the first simple multimodal model we proposed. Uh, we use the CNN to get uh, image representations and encode both the tweet text and the image text extracted by the OCR as the last hidden state of the LSTM. Concatenate those multimodal features. Uh, we add a couple of fully connected layers and train it for uh, hate, not hate classification. This is a more complex model we proposed. Uh, we call it uh, textual kernel models, and it's inspired by those two words on visual question answering and uh, semantic segmentation guided by natural language queries. Um, and the idea is to learn CNN kernels depending, dependent on the textual representations with the objective of um, providing explicit capacity to the model to learn those visual and textual interactions. And then we also concatenate the textual representations uh, in the spatial dimension. Those are the results we get. Uh, the input columns show uh, the inputs that are available for each one of the models. Uh, and the results show that both modalities, the visual and the textual modalities, are useful for uh, the task of head speech detection. But that the combination of, those, of both modalities does not boost the performance compared to unimodal textual detection. Um, and on the bottom, we see the top scored images uh, by the CNN for hate and non-hate. And as you see, the CNN is learning to um, detect nudity or memes images at suspicious to contain hate and uh, portrait images of, or images of people posing as uh, not malicious. Okay, so uh, what are the conclusions of the work? Uh, well, that this is a task with a high uh, social, scientific, and political interest, but it's a very challenging one, right? Uh, it's challenging um, because of the complex and diverse um, textual and visual interactions we need to learn. Also because um, the amount of multimodal hate speech is so small compared to the overall textual hate speech. Uh, and then because um, it's kind of a subjective task, so it's difficult to get proper annotations. 
So what we can do to address this task? Uh, well, uh, we could try to transfer knowledge from other modalities. For instance, we could try to, to use uh, already learned visual features that are relevant in the hate speech detection task. Um, we could, we should uh, get more data and more annotators and if possible expert annotators, but that's expensive. Or we could try to learn from other kind of data, for instance, from social media interactions or maybe from synthetic data. Uh, to conclude uh, some related work, um, when we started working in this task, there was not consistent study or database uh, existing for multimodal hate speech detection. Uh, so the one we uh, published here is the first data set, but in parallel to this work, uh, two papers came out. The first one from Facebook, um, they uh, learned from user-reported data um, hate speech detection, and they try different multimodal fusion strategies, which provide a boost compared to uh, textual uh, detection, uh, but they don't publish the data set. Uh, and the second one is made also here in Barcelona, in UPC, and targets uh, multimodal hate speech detection on memes. So uh, that's all, if you have any question. Thank you for the talk. Now it's time for questions. Anyone? Um, thank you for the talk, first of all. Um, do you have any example in which maybe your system solved the issue that you mentioned that um, by separate text and image don't contain hate, but then when you join both information, then you see that for a certain example, um, it actually takes hate speech. I mean, it is very difficult in my opinion to have um, such a high level of abstraction in the information. So like for example of the Mediterranean Sea, to actually um, know these, these relations, and especially you need, I just mentioned a lot of um, previous information, like what are the continents, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in the context of humor also, yeah. there's, uh, there's irony, there's abstraction, there's a lot of things that, um, um, how far do you think that you can get with these systems and how different is like from detecting certain patterns only? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, uh, it's true that it's difficult to uh, learn oops, uh, to learn uh, some of these complex relations, uh, but um, I think that images can be very useful in some cases. For instance, uh, uh, when you have these um, slang keywords that maybe uh, are, for instance, uh, kind of race slang, uh, the image can really like give you information about the intention of the user. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's true that it's uh, quite, complica com quite complicated to really learn it and to uh, distinguish between different kinds of uh, users' intentions. And also, that's why I think uh, this task uh, should be supported by people studying uh, hate speech from a social perspective uh, to also work together with them uh, to uh, like, uh, yeah, like uh, unit forcers and see where these kind of techniques can be really applied. Okay, so we have time for another question. Hi, thank you. Um, it's related to the previous question. Uh, who would be an expert annotator in this case? Who would be an expert annotator? Who would be an expert annotator? Uh, well, uh, there's uh, many people um, studying uh, what is hate speech, studying uh, how it's the, the, the hate speech presence in, in, in social networks. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think uh, that, no? Uh, I'm not, I'm not um, like talking here about uh, content control or about which kind of censorship we should apply in social media. It's more uh, about uh, mm, like uh, preventing hate speech uh, in other ways, right? Uh, analyzing it, studying why it uh, it happens, uh, the different spotlights. So mm, yeah, mm, I mean, not someone who is ruling a social network, but someone who is like uh, studying uh, hate speech socially. Yeah.
have you considered to include also information about the user? It's possible to characterize the, the user? Uh, yeah, um, I mean, I have considered it, but I have not done it. But that's uh, really, um, I think it would be a really useful information for this. Because, for instance, in Twitter, uh, you could use all the user um, timeline uh, to really um, learn or, or decide the, his like uh, intention. So yeah, I think that's a really important thing as well. And I think uh, the thing I was mentioning here about learning from social media user reports or interactions at Facebook this in this work is definitely a good approach to um, target this task. Yeah. Thank you. So let's thank the speaker again. Okay, thanks. Our next speaker is Adria Arcasens. Uh, he was a PhD student at MIT, and he graduated no, uh, early this month. And he's going to, to join in DeepMind in February. And he's going to talk about learning words by drawing images. So uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be oops, uh, talking here and to, to be presenting this work that we submitted, that we presented at CVPR uh, in June. So this is joint work with Tida Xuris, uh, David Bao, David Harwards, Jim Glass, and uh, Antonio Torralba. It's basically a collaboration between the audio and speech group at MIT and the, the vision group, and particular mention to Tida Xuris, who couldn't be here today, but this is part of his master thesis, so I think he, he deserves to mention. So, when we think about uh, machine learning problems, most of the times we think about some kind of structural ready given. So if you think about the classical problem of image classification, we are usually like, given images and then we are giving labels. And this label set is usually closed. We have a list of 1,000, 2,000 uh, labels, but we are basically given this closed set of uh, labels. So here we have a fire track, we have a tree, and this is on not only happening on image classification, it does happen also on image segmentation, it happens on object detection, on action recognition, on even in visual question answering, where we are sometimes given the question and some closed set of answer or open set. In any case, uh, all these uh, ways of uh, actually presenting the data help us as a, a machine learning researchers to kind of structure all our models and all our training in terms of, okay, what is the kind of output do we want and how do we train that? However, when we look at how humans learn, we learn very differently. We learn exploring the world, we learn talking to, to each other, we learn essentially uh, listening to other people, explaining things to us. So basically, in this project, what we what we wanted to do is we wanted to learn in this kind of more unconstrained way. So the goal of this project is to uh, learn grounded uh, spoken words to uh, visual uh, elements. And what this means is basically if you have a description like this one of images, what you want to do is you want to match each part of the description to the image. Now, we could do this with text. The thing is text already has some structure. Text is, text is already pre-segmented. It's clean because there are no like, uh, if you repeat a word, it's always the same. If you say a word every time we say it, there are different accents, different intonations, different ways of saying it, so every time it's different. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna not use text and we're gonna go directly to audio. Uh, and basically, we're gonna try to find the relation between the particular words in the audio and the objects in the image. Now, previous work, uh, which is also from uh, this collaboration between the image and audio group at MIT, uh, the way we trained this was we're given a description of a particular image, so this is a description of the car, and we want uh, that in the embedding space these two things are, these, these two elements are very close. What we are gonna do to train that is we're gonna use the triplet loss, which basically will take a different description and we'll try to push this, um, these two elements away. So we want this uh, car with a different description to be far away. And we are gonna try to basically find a mismatch image, which basically, it's also, we are gonna also force this to have like low similarity with the description. So basically what we are telling the system is this description describes this car and it doesn't describe this image. And this car is, is described by this description, but not by any other description. 
The problem is uh, we have limited data to do that. So the data set is large, and we trained with data sets that are 400,000 images. But then when you think about what the network has to solve here, it has to distinguish between these two images, basically. And these two images is an image of a car, and it's an image of a ship. The system worked very, very good at detecting objects, but then it had more trouble to actually learning colors, learning textures, learning sizes, because basically it doesn't need it. When you learn about like the different objects in the image, you can solve this problem most of the times. Now, what happens if instead of give, giving this random negative, I, I give this negative? Now, these two cars are the same car. It's exactly the same picture. The only difference is the color. If I train the system this way, I force the system to actually learn the difference between white, white and, and black. And basically, that's the goal of this project. We want to create this kind of negatives so that we can force the system to actually learn attributes through spoken descriptions of images. Now, the problem is we don't have this kind of images, at least in the large scale. I took this image because the car vendor actually produces the same image for multiple colors. Uh, but it's very difficult to actually generate all these images for um, with different attributes. So we, do, uh, we basically generate them. So one thing you will notice is that instead of working with natural images, we work with images uh, from the Clever data set. This, is, this, this system could just apply to natural images. The difference is that in here we had a lot of control about all these different attributes that were happening, and for evaluation it's essentially easier. But in any way, the idea is what we're going to do is we're going to generate images. Uh, so for those of you that are not really familiar with generative adversarial networks, the idea is that you have a nice random vector at the input. You, you basically input it to a network, and at the end, you get a photorealistic image. You see that uh, we train this gun with the clever. So what we get is essentially all these different shapes of different colors, different sizes. And if now I, imp I change the uh, input vector, I get a different image. And then if I do this a lot of times, I get all these different images. Now, now I basically built a data set of images, but nothing changes from the previous case, where basically we have a lot of images and that's it. The nice thing here is that as we are actually using Kagan, we can edit the images. So this is uh, actually derived from work from David Bao and others, which was presented at ICLR uh, 2019 this year. And what they showed is that if you go inside the generative model and you basically zero out some dimensions in the generative model, what you're going to do is you're going to change some things in the image. So let's say we go inside, and now we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to zero out some dimensions. And if I do that, now this image changed a bit. So basically, I'm going to do this so that you can see, but this ball became essentially a, a cylinder. And now if I do this again, uh, what I'm going to do is the ball became blue again, but now this uh, yellow ball is brown. So basically, by going inside the model and touching the, the internal representation, what I can do is essentially I can edit particular attributes of the image. Now, in this example, I randomly sample that, and we see all these different changes. But the key question here is exactly, how, what do I touch so that actually the system learns to find different attributes? So the first thing we did is we collected captions. And I'm going to show you one so that you understand basically what is the input of the system. So we generated these images, and then we went online. And we asked people, OK, can you describe this image? And we get descriptions like this one. OK, uh -uh. now we need the sound. OK, I'm going to pretend I'm the described. There is a sound here, uh, but it doesn't work. Uh, or at least I'm not able to make it work. So basically, uh, you would get a description like, uh, there is a, a green cylinder next to another green cylinder behind a, a brown cube. So you would get descriptions like that, uh, and we would basically get uh, 20,000 descriptions like that. Now, how do we model this input? We have images and descriptions, and the only thing we know is that they go together. Uh, so essentially, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to pass the input image through a fully convolutional network. We're going to pass the input audio through a fully convolutional network. And now what we get is we have an 8 by 8 by uh, 512, which is the feature uh, dimension, in the output of the, um, the, the image side. And then uh, time, so the number of um, times times, uh, times 512s in the, in the audio side. So we can actually do a dot product of these two things. And what we get is a similarity map. So this similarity map, what it basically represents is that in each particular moment in time, we want to know in which part of the image the people is talking about. So that's what we do, a dot product for each moment in time and each part of the image. We just take a dot product, and we get this uh, tensor map, which is 8 by 8 by the, the number of timestamps. Uh, 
And what we're going to do now is we're going to train the system using this tensor. The problem is we don't have this kind of annotations because the only thing we have is essentially pairs of images and descriptions. So what we're going to do is we're going to compress this map into one number. How do we do that? So we want this number to be representative on whether this description describes these images or not. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the maximum in the uh, spatial dimension. So we want that in each moment of the description, at least they are talking about something in the image. And then we're going to do an average over time, which basically says that in all the moments in the description, we want people to talk about the image and not about something else. Now, basically, we go back to the setting where we have uh, the description, we have the image, we want this to be far, uh, and basically we can, we can take a random negative. But now, as we are actually generating these images with the GAN, what we can do is we can create edited negatives. And that's basically the whole, the, the whole idea of the paper. What we are going to do now is we're going to train the system so that with a given image and a description, we're going to create all, all these edited negatives that will force the system to basically learn attributes. Now, I think I'm a bit short on time, so I'm going to go a bit fast. Uh, the idea is uh, we have images, descriptions. What we're going to do is we're going to select one object to change. And now we're going to go into the generative model. We're going to essentially zero out some dimensions that I will just explain a bit how, how we do this. And we're going to get a negative image that has at least one attribute change. And then we're going to use this as a negative. So how do we remove concepts? If we knew exactly what to change, this is what it would look like. So let's say we know exactly where the yellow responsible unit in the generative model. If we zero out them, we're going to basically remove yellow. Or if we knew where are the cylinder units, if we zero out them, we're going to remove the cylinders. Now, how do we know exactly uh, where are the, res the yellow res uh, the units responsible for green? So we have this uh, audiovisual model. And essentially, uh, we're going to look into the embedding space in the visual, visual domain and the audio domain. And we're going to cluster these, uh, these embedding vectors into different concepts. The way we cluster them, uh, and I'm not going to go in details, is essentially by co-occurrence. So if, unit, uh, if dimension 1, 13, and 116 are always activated together, we put them together in a cluster. And what we get are all these different concepts. So this is one concept which you see that it's corresponding to balls. It's completely unsupervised clustering. Uh, so this is another cluster uh, concept, which is blue. And here we get the, the green cluster. Now we, know, we basically know how to recognize green into the images. So what we can do is we can use, again, uh, the, the paper from Bauer all at ICLR and say, well, we are going to generate a lot of images. We know where are the green, the green elements in the image. So we go back to the generative model, and we look in the generative model which parts activate when there, there is a green element. So we basically pass different images. You see at the end, this is the segmentation that it's given by our clustering. And what it's giving us is essentially the, the green parts. And now what we end up having is a list of, uh, of neurons in the generative model that are responsible for uh, green elements. So this is one, and this is another one. So now we go back to our example and we say, well, now we know exactly what produces green. So we're going to zero out all the neurons that produce green, and we get blue. So we can do this with a lot of images. And what we get, you see different examples here. We get change of shape, change of color, even change of materials in some times. So we get all these different edits. So now let's go back to the general system again. And essentially, um, we have the, the positive image. Uh, and we select a particular concept. We look in the clustering, in the embedding space, which concept is present there. And what we're going to do is we're going to go into the generative model, and we're going to remove it. So in here, we detected there is the yellow ball. We remove the yellow. We get a brown. And now we train the system. So now the results part is going to be fun, because I don't have audio. So uh, I can try to pretend that I'm the describer. Uh, let's do that. So someone would say something like, there is a red ball, Shiny ball. in front. Behind it is a large gray matte ball. Behind that is a small gray matte cube. So basically, you saw how the system is able to kind of pick up the different elements, and it even picks up the relation between the different elements in the, in the image. Now, how evaluating is hard. One evaluation that we came up with is this idea of, OK, you are giving the system two images. One image has an attribute. The other doesn't have the attribute. And basically, we force the system to pick up one of the two. So we input the image. We get the similarity for the image that has the attribute for the image that doesn't have. And basically, we take the one with maximum similarity. Uh, so basically, the left one has a cube. The right one doesn't have a cube. And we input the sound like this. Uh, 
cube. Cube and the cube. 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 Cube and cube. cube. And what we want basically is that it picks the left one, which has a cube. So if we train the system without anything else, we get to 65%. Now, if we randomly ablate neurons without any particular uh, reason, uh, we get to 71%. But now, if we use our, our clustering methods to ablate the neurons, we get to uh, above 73%. Uh, now, if we use, uh, if we take the mini batch and we take the hardest uh, negative in the mini batch, we improve significantly from our uh, from our baseline. But now we can combine the both and say, well, I'm going to take the hardest from the hard negative in the mini batch and the edited image. So if we combine with the random, we get a bit of improvement, and if we combine with our method, we get uh, much improvement. So just as a summary, uh, the idea here behind this um, this paper is that. Uh, our uh, speech is actually a rich source of training data to learn to ground concepts between images and, uh, and descriptions. Generating our training data, and this is actually not particular to speech, generating our training data allows us to create better curriculums for our systems, and I think this can be applicable to all, all different tasks. And then uh, if, we want, if we want to edit, one thing we can do is actually use generative models and touch the internal representations in generative model to actually uh, edit our, our images. So that's it. I think, yeah, I'm a bit late. Uh, thanks. We are a little bit over time, so we'll have only one question. Someone? Uh, okay, well, I have a short question. Um, so you said that for the hard negatives, you change at least one attribute. Uh, and do you use any kind of curriculum learning? That is, you start with only one attribute change and then move to more so than one, or? The system requires to be pre-trained uh, by, like, general with the random one. Otherwise, if you start from the beginning, it doesn't convert. So there is basically a series of pre-training that, that you can do. But once we start doing the, the clustering, we don't control uh, the number of attributes that we change. Uh, the idea is to change one. Sometimes it changes one. Sometimes, depending on the neuron configurations, it may change more than one. But, but yeah, we, we don't control that. OK, thank you. Thank you. OK, so uh, the last talk of this session is by Luis Gomez. And he's a postdoc at uh, Com Computer Vision Center. And he will talk about a scene text visual question answering. Hello, everyone. Uh, so this is uh, work that I've been working during the last year with many colleagues of the CBC, Ali, Ruben, Andres, uh, Marsal, Ernest, and Demosthenes. Some of them are actually around here. Uh, and also with some people from Triple IT from India. Uh, this is a work about visual question answering, but it's about a specific type of questions that you can do given an image, in which the answer to the questions is uh, only possible to be answered correctly if you read the text that appear in the image. Like, for example, here, if I'm asking you where is the train going, you have to understand that you are in a train station, that there is one train there, and that probably this train is going to New York because it's announced in the image, right? Uh, so if we make this kind of questions to a model or to an agent, this red guy here, that has been trained with a standard big way data set, he will don't know at all how to answer this question. And basically, the reason is that because this guy doesn't know how to read text. Instead, if uh, we have a model, this green robot here, that we have teach it to read text from images, he will have no problem in this case because he will relate the word price in the question with this uh, string of characters that he knows it's a price. So this is the only price that appears in the image. It's an easy answer for him. But the problem is even more interesting if you look at cases like this, right? Uh, in here, what you have is a question uh, for what is written on top of the booth. Uh, the red robot doesn't know how to read, but still he is able to provide the correct answer because here the visual context in the image is providing all the important information in order to make a correct answer. And on the other hand, the green guy knows how to read text information. He can extract all this textual information from the image, but he cannot provide the correct answer here because uh, 
unless he learns how to uh, use the visual context of the image to answer the question. So what we want is actually to have models that are able to tackle correctly this interplay between visual and textual information, to reason about the question, and then to, pro to provide the correct answer that may be using any of these modalities, right? So, in order to work in this interesting problem, we have created a new data set, the Syntex Big Way data set. It has more than 31,000 question answer pairs, over more than 20,000 images. Obviously, it took a lot of hours of annotation to create this data set. We have used Amazon Mechanical Turk, but we have also invested a lot of time from our lab uh, in designing the correct uh, procedure to annotate this data in order to um, ensure that we have a minimum of quality on the data, right? So there are a lot of details about the creation and annotation of the data set on the paper. I'm going to skip this part on the presentation. But uh, what I want to say is that in parallel e or with this work, in parallel with this work, there has been another research group in Facebook that has published a similar data set with a similar scale. So we are lucky here because now we have double the time of training data. And it's also an indicator that this is an interesting problem, not only in our group, but also for the community of computer vision in general. Um, the next thing I want to show you are some statistics about the data set. To have an idea more or less of what we are talking about, what we can do is to take a look at the diversity in questions and also in the diversity of the answers in the data set. So here what we have is the frequency of appearance of different words in different positions of the questions. So in the center of this circle, we can see that uh, the, in the vast majority of the questions, the first uh, word of the question is what. We have also some questions that start with where, with which, with who, etc. but the vast majority of the questions start with what. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense because if you are asking about uh, something that can only be answered with text that appears in the image, you will probably end up having questions like what is the name, what is the number, uh, what does the sign say, etc. right? So we have a clear bias in the questions of the data, but it's a bias that can be explained and actually make a lot of sense for this particular task. What, we'll, uh, what would be much more problematic is to have biases on the answers, not on the questions. And this is because in big way, we already know that uh, these biases on the answers are dangerous. The reason is that our models training on a biased data set will learn how to exploit these biases in order to get better results. Uh, so what I'm showing here is the distribution of the answers for different type of questions, right? So in the first column, we have the answers for all the questions that start with what company. And as you can see, each color is, uh, corresponds to a different answer. And as you can see, uh, we have an almost uh, uniform distribution of answers, which is good for us because it means there is no bias here. We have some bias in a specific questions, like for example, what does the sign say, in which many of the answers are a stop, or also if we are asking about the specific years. But apart of these two types of questions, we can see that in general, the data set is not biased on the answers. So this is, means that the data set will be useful to really learn to answer those questions. Okay, so with this data set, uh, we organized a competition, which was the ST Big Way IGDAR competition this year. And uh, we organized the competition along three different tasks. The difference between these tasks is that in some of them, we are providing a dictionary, a vocabulary of words, together with each one of the images in the data set. So that um, the methods can use these dictionaries because they know that in this dictionary, they have the correct words 
that uh, they have to use to provide the correct answer, right? So for example, in task one, we are providing uh, strongly contextualized dictionaries, which are very small dictionaries with 100 words for each one of the image. In the second task, we are providing a big dictionary for all the images in the data set, but this dictionary contains all the words that appear in all the answers of the data set, so the size is much bigger, 30,000 words. And in the third task, uh, we provide no dictionary at all, so we are encouraging here methods that are able to uh, recognize text by their own without using any extra information. On top of that, for the competition, we are proposing a new evaluation metric. And the reason for what we are proposing a new metric is that uh, the metric that is normally used in big way data sets, which is accuracy, doesn't fit very well with the problem we have here at hand. Uh, if you look at the accuracy metric for these particular examples, you can see that obviously accuracy for a single question uh, is a hard decision. Either you provide a perfect match with the ground truth, you have 100% accuracy, either you provide an incorrect answer and you have zero accuracy. But uh, the metric we are proposing, which is based on a string edit distance, is going to give us more information about the errors that the methods are doing. Because what we do here is to take into account the errors on the transcription, transcription of the text. So it may be that the model has reasoned correctly about the question and has spotted correctly the text that provides the answer, but the method at the times of transcribing the text has produced some small errors in a few of the characters of the text, right? So our metric is going to penalize less than accuracy, these kind of errors. Yeah, uh, finally, uh, on top of all that, we have provided also uh, many different baselines for this data set. Uh, for example, the green guys here are methods that use only OCR information to answer the questions. The red guys are a standard big way models that doesn't know how to read the text. In particular, we are using stacked attention networks and show, ask, attend, and answer method. And the blue guys are modifications of these standard big way models in which we are trying to um, add textual information. So basically, both of them are working with a simple concatenation of visual and textual features. What we can see in this table is that using visual and textual information is in the last row providing a little bit of better results than the rest of the baselines, but still a simple OCR method with some heuristic to select the answers could perform comparable in some of the tasks, right? So the results are also very low for the baselines, are no more than that, so there is a lot of room for improvement. And if we look at the results of the competition, what we see is that uh, some of the methods are not very well, are in same branch as the baselines we provided, but in particular the two winner models are uh, much better, outperform, are able to outperform the baselines we have provided. Um, I have to say that uh, nowadays this is a very outlined leaderboard because there is a recent paper from a research group in Facebook that has doubled the results of these methods here. Uh, but still, I think they are at 40% uh, accuracy in task three, so there is uh, still a lot of room for improvement in this particular task. That's all from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, I will be happy to answer. Questions? Hi. Um, for each scene, is there a unique question, or each scene has multiple questions in the data set? 
in principle, we ask the, the attackers to generate one question per image, but uh, for some of the images, we collected more than one different question. So this explains that we have 23,000 images and 31,000 questions. Some of them have more than one question. Well, so uh, we don't have time for more questions, so let's thank the speaker again. All right, so now uh, there's no coffee break, uh, but I invite you to the next session on uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, so our first speaker is uh, Xavier Puig, uh, PhD student from MIT, who's gonna be telling us about uh, his uh, most recent paper at CVPR. Well, as soon as the technical difficulties are managed. Right, uh, thanks a lot for the introduction and thank you to Deep Learning Barcelona for organizing this symposium and inviting me here. It's really an honor to be talking here. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, Virtual Home, which is a platform to simulate human household activities and some work that we have been doing in learning to infer those activities and perform them under, under different environments. This is joint work with, uh, between MIT and the University of Toronto and it's thanks to my collaborators here, uh, Kevin, Marco, Andrew, Jaman, Tingu, Sania and, and Antonio. So, So one of the holy grails of AI is probably to have agents to help us at household tasks. And this is a task that involves many different kinds of activities. On one hand, we need to be able to understand the environment, reason about objects and their affordances, and how to navigate it. And if we want to um, teach agents to perform uh, actions through descriptions or through demonstrations, we need these agents to be able to map those to actions that they will be performing in the environment, which requires to understand the activities and the descriptions. And while there are amazing works at um, learning to perform actions uh, through demonstrations or through goals, and Carlos will be giving an excellent talk on this, uh, most of these environments uh, are focused on, re on really learning like low level of tasks, such as stacking blocks and so on. And we clearly cannot deploy robots directly on, on a home. We really need an environment where they can practice before performing those tasks. So with that in mind, we built Virtual Home, which is an environment built in Unity that allows to simulate and perform these household tasks. So the environment is built in Unity. It's made of uh, seven different apartments with agents that are interactable and some objects that can be uh, actuated. And one key of the environment is that we uh, describe, we basically represent these activities as, as computer programs, where each program represents an activity where, where uh, each instruction is basically uh, an atomic action that the agent will perform with different objects. And by concatenating these atomic actions, you can have agents performing these uh, long-term activities. So what we did was to implement uh, animations for uh, many of these atomic actions. And um, given a program, we would concatenate them to generate long-term activities of, of these agents. And what this allows us is to have Basically, the, way, the same way that we can have agents providing activities or descriptions of activities, we can have agents performing them in a real environment and allowing for a long data set of, of activities and actions. Now, something important about this environment is not only to be able to generate these actions in, in, in the environment, agents really need to have common sense knowledge. If we, talk, if we ask an agent to, for example, watch TV, we need to tell it where is the remote control in order to be able to watch it. If it has to, for example, sit in the sofa, we should tell it that the sofa has to be facing the TV and that it should be sitting properly. And if it has to drink while watching TV, we should probably tell it to really point on the right place to drink. Similarly, agents need to know about object affordances, physics, forces of objects, and so on. 
if we don't tell them that, they will probably end up destroying the environment before doing anything, anything, anything useful. And that probably states the importance of using simulators before doing things in the real world. So we need common sense for that. So what we did after building the environment was to build a common uh, sense knowledge base about how to perform different activities. We asked people to come up with different activities to do at home, provide us with a description of how to do this activity, and then write one of those programs that would represent the activity. And to do that, we designed a programming language where uh, people would stack um, blocks of instructions uh, to create these activities. And each block would be one action, and people would have to reason about object instances and would have to concatenate them to perform these, these actions. So for something like set up a table, we would want something like this, a program with all the instructions that are required to perform the activity. We got very interesting programs. We even got uh, like examples of how to do Thanksgiving with all the instructions about how to set up the table and invite the right people. And some people even told us how to do research, with like setting up a nice working place and hopping up board and so, and so on. And I wish it was as easy as that. So we ended up collecting 3,000 activities that correspond to working, cleaning environments, and so on. And you can see here that we can actually use the programs as sentences to actually cluster them through similarity and understand the semantics of them. And you can find here some of the activities we have along with the descriptions and, and so on. All right, so we have a simulator with descriptions of actions and programs that are matching these, these actions. So what we can do is actually take uh, each one of those videos and use a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model to predict the program that is happening in this video. In the end, the program is a form of description that is much more structured and that allows us to have the agent perform the activities. Now, this, um, it's more complex than that, because what we really want to do is not to predict exactly the program that is happening here. What we would like to do is take a video of one activity where it's happening in a, different, in a, in a given apartment and then be able to go to a new apartment where the conditions may be different. Maybe suddenly the TV is off and there's no remote control or the sofa is occupied by some entity and we would like to be adjust to that. So what would happen if we just executed the same program that we predicted? Well, the agent would have some trouble. He wouldn't be able to sit on the sofa and when he tries to watch TV, because it didn't predict like turn on the TV before, it wouldn't be able to watch the TV. So similar to how we do in um, computer programs or in programming, we want these programs to have exceptions. So if this is the program that we predicted at the beginning from the description, we should be able to understand that not all uh, TVs have a controller, so maybe we don't need to grab the controller. There may be some things for a cat in the sofa, so we need to be able to make space for it. And if the TV is on, off, we need to be able to turn it on in order to watch TV, in order to reconstruct the activity. So once we have these exceptions and we have corrected the program, we can have an agent performing the same activity that was originally doing. Finally, make, make space in the sofa and be able to watch uh, TV properly. So how do we do that? The idea is actually also uh, uh, basically uh, based on computer programs. And the idea is instead of predicting a full program, what we want to do is predict a sketch. The idea is that we don't want to predict every, like, all the things about the program. We don't want to predict the things that have to do with the environment. We don't care if the TV is in the living room or that we need a controller. What we care about is about the essential instructions of this program. So instead of predicting the full program, we will start by only predicting the sketch of the activity, and we again can do that by using a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model or any model that um, does, like, goes from like, a video to a description. And then once we have the program, we will uh, use this sketch and the new environment to predict our, our target program. So let's say that we have already predicted the sketch from the demonstration. How can we go to the new program? Because we have a simulator, we can extract a symbolic representation of the environment, but you could imagine using maybe object detectors and so on to build a graph of this environment. And here, every node corresponds to an object, and the edges correspond to relationships, such as in this example, the cat is on the sofa. We use a graph neural network to obtain embeddings for each one of the nodes, and the idea is that these nodes, these embeddings should contain information about the state of the objects, whether the TV is on or is off. We will first encode this uh, sketch, and we will use the encoding of the sketch to first predict what object we want to interact with, and which action we want to do with this object. And because as we are doing actions, we want to change the state of these objects, 
we will learn how to change this representation of these objects so that when we grab the cat from the cat from the sofa, the model learns that the sofa is not occupied anymore, and now we can sit in it. So we'll do this step by step. We'll first like walk to the, walk to the well, find the couch, grab the cat, put the cat somewhere to sit, and so on. So what this allows us to do is to take one given sketch here, sit in the sofa and read a book, take two different environments, and for the same sketch, predict two different programs that are depending on these environments. So for example, if there's like some phone in the sofa, the sofa is occupied, the model should learn to remove things from the sofa before sitting in there. If the book is near the sofa, the model in one case doesn't need to like really um, stand up to grab the book. It can actually like grab the book and sit in the sofa directly. But when the book is far away, it has to like maybe stand up and go grab the book. Notice that the model has some limitations because here the agent doesn't have any notion about efficiency. Like why sitting if it has to then go grab a book? And this what allows us to do is to go from one script from one video of some activity. Here an agent maybe like putting groceries in a fridge where the kitchen is in the counter and the milk is in the table. And then when we go to a new, well, predict, predicting the sketch, this is like the only thing that we need to know, which is putting the, fr the groceries. And when we go to a new environment where the conditions are different, suddenly the chicken is in the fridge, change the activity accordingly so that the agent adapts to the new environments. And again, this is an example where the agent really needs to know about efficiency, like why taking the chicken out of the fridge if I had to put it back in. So in summary, in this work, we explore how to create uh, programs that can adapt to environments. And this is important because as the agent is doing things, it should know how the environment is changing and how to adapt the programs. And I guess that this is one step uh, towards a larger goal, which is to make activities with uh, multiple agents performing actions in them, where in this case, different agents can be changing the environment, and each agent has to reason about what are the other agent's goals, and anticipate how the environment will change accordingly. With that, I conclude my talk. Uh, I would like to thank again my collaborators and just letting you know that the simulator is online and easy to, and free to use, as well as the data set. And thanks so much. I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much for this. Uh, so does anybody have questions? We got time for like one or two. Oh, all the way in the back. All right, I'm coming. Hi, uh, thank you for the very interesting talk. Uh, very quick question. So I'm interested, how do you encode things like common sense reasoning and physics and whatever? Is, is this completely data driven or do you give it like certain kind of rules or how, how do you actually make it reason over things that are common to us? Like you can, I don't know, take a box but you cannot take, uh, I don't know, the cell phone on your own or something like that. Right, so the physics part of common sense knowledge is hard coded and it's built on the environment. The common sense knowledge that we really encode is things such as, one, like how to perform the activities, and that means um, w implicitly which kind of objects you can interact with and which kind you cannot do. And also, uh, basically, um, common sense about the relationship of objects. So the example I was giving, if you want to watch TV, you have to sit somewhere where the agent can see it. And we also collected information about where objects are typically laid out. So basically, common sense about what is the common layout of houses and how agents should interact in them. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, so now as the new speaker is uh, setting up, maybe we can take one more question. Uh, see if anybody's up. Oh, oh. sorry. I'm Hi, so you said that um, you like make a new program based on a sketch program, but are you planning to do like the sketch program from the description of the task, somehow with natural language processing or somehow like that? That's right, maybe I didn't explain it well. Uh, so the, the, the model works in, in, in two steps. One first step where we are predicting the sketch from a, demo, a video of the task from the virtual, from the simulator or a description. And we do that using sequence-to-sequence -sequence models. And a second step, which is based on this prediction of the sketch, 
we um, we predict the program with them like, that matches the environment. All right, so uh, so let's uh, thank the speaker again. All right, and next up is uh, Ignacy Clavera from uh, UC Berkeley, uh, talking about uh, model-based reinforcement learning through meta-learning. Looking forward. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to present my talk in, as I say, model-based reinforcement learning through meta-learning, and this is work done at UC Berkeley with a bunch of fantastic collaborators and with my advisor, Professor Peter Will. So just over 10 years ago, Willow Garage uh, released this video of their new robot. And here they show that in the near future, we'll have a full robot that will perform all the tedious tasks that we don't want to do at home. And obviously, this has not happened yet. And I don't think we're near uh, near that uh, to accomplish this sort of like full autonomous. However, there has been, yeah, it even grabs a beer for you. However, there has been a lot of success in AI uh, recently in the last decade, and specifically in reinforcement learning. It all started with the paper from DQN in Mineral in 2013, and more recently, and he will present later, we all been yells with the Alpha Star. However, all this all this work has been done in simulation. There has been barely that much success in the in the real world. And one of the main issues for this is sample complexity. For instance, here, even in the in the DQN paper, they tested how human humans will how fast humans will learn. And humans after 15 minutes tend to outperform the deeper L agent that I was trained for 115 hours. And in order to achieve the superhuman or human uh, performance, it needed to 920 hours, which is the killing at 40 days. So just imagine now if that robot that we used seen at the beginning was to do our dishes, it's a much more complicated task than just playing Atari. It will take just months, and just imagine the amount of Tupperware that you will need to buy. So, the paradigm of how the reinforcement learning works is you have an agent that each time step, it takes an action in the world. And the result of this action, action leads to a, a different reward. And the role of the agent is to maximize the sum of rewards uh, across the episode. So most of the success that we have seen in reinforcement learning is through model-free RL. That essentially uh, falls into this paradigm where the actions, where the behavior is, is maximized uh, through interaction with the environment, and the maximization is the flow sum of rewards. But there's another category of methods that is called model-based reinforcement learning, where the interaction is used to actually learn a dynamical model of the world. This dynamical model is then learned, is then, is then used to actually maximize the action. So all the part that you are all, all, all the samples that you use are from the learned simulator instead of the real world. So there is no need for interaction. As a result, these methods are much more sample efficient than just small free methods. However, the main issue with them is that they don't achieve the same asymptotic performance. The reason for that is very analogous to the standard uh, overfitting in machine learning, where when you have high, high capacity function approximations, such as neural networks, they do very well on your training data, but when you test them on the validation set, they perform poorly. What happens in model base is that you, your policy is optimized over the model, and this is the equivalent of the training data. And then, but what you actually care about is the real world performance. This problem is known as model bias, and the issue is that the learned model is different from the real world. What people have been trying to do over the last years is just try to learn a better model. However, learning, le learning models uh, are not the, learn models are not the real world, so there will be always a mismatch between the real one and the learn, which can lead to catastrophic failures. What we do instead, we draw inspiration from recent work on domain randomization and dynamic randomization, where essentially they've proven that you actually don't need uh, accurate models, what you just need it's a lot of diverse uh, subset of uh, inaccurate models. And then you just need to learn a robust policy or adaptive, uh, adaptive policy. 
in our, in our work, we use these to learn a diverse set of methods, and then we learn uh, um, meta policy on top of that methods. So the standard of reinforcement learning uses have a single agent and one task. In the context of meta reinforcement learning, you have a bunch of tasks that each task could be either a different reward function or a different uh, environment. And the goal of meta reinforcement learning is to learn a policy that can quickly adapt to a new task. So essentially, after a few interactions of a new task, what you want is to be able to adapt your policy and maximize the performance in each of these tasks. So this is how canonical model-based RL works. You first collect data on your current policy, learn the dynamics model using all the previous data, and improve your policy. What we did instead is collecting data under our adaptive policy, because now we have a meta policy. And instead of learning a single dynamic model, we learn an ensemble of them. And then we improve this meta policy over the ensemble. So the key thing is that each model corresponds to a different task. So we, what we actually learn is a policy that is able to adapt to different dynamics. And then at the real world, it, it will be able to adapt to the dynamics of the, of the real environment. So at each iteration, we get a new meta policy and a new set of, uh, of adaptive policies. We tested this algorithm in a set of uh, Mujoko benchmarks that are all robotics and locomotion. And here we can see the performance of, a, of a, a three of them. So first of all, all the methods just perform random actions. But then we see how MBMPO, that's our method, and then here we compare against uh, PPO, that it's a model-free algorithm. We see that just under 30 minutes of experience, it's actually able to solve the task that is uh, to run forward. Here we see a comparison against small free algorithms, and our method is the red curve. And we see that it's able to achieve the same uh, synthetic performance than small free methods, while nearly 100 times less samples. We finally tested on the, on the real PR2. And the task is pretty straightforward. It's just put the red block on top of the, of the yellow one. And we see that just our four minutes of experience is sort of doing it. It's getting close, and it will take it about 10 minutes of real-world uh, interaction to actually solve the task. In contrast, uh, PPO is still doing random actions at, by that point. So this is great. We, we have been able to learn uh, stacking policy in just 10 minutes when it will just take uh, 10 times or 100 times more with a model-free algorithm. The issue with this is that if you were actually to start that robot, it will take about two hours to solve the task. And that is because a lot of computation is happening in between each rollout. So we have decreased a lot the sample complexity, but the actual, the actual training time is still pretty long because of this amount of computation. So what we did is to change a little bit how canonical model-based uh, reinforcement learning is trained. So canonical model-based, you first collect data with the environment, store this into a data buffer, learn a model, improve the policy, and repeat. But we did instead is to make the entire framework asynchronous. So now we have these this servers of parameters, the model parameters, and the policy parameters, and the data buffer. And each of the three different processes, the collection data, improve policy, and learn model, all happens at the same time asynchronously. So what this led is to much more, much more stable training. Because since improve, the policy improvement and learning model happens at the same time, it's very hard for the policy to overfit to the current model. Because just the model is changing all the time. Since everything is happening asynchronous. And the other further benefit is that the improved policy step and the collection data step also happens at the same time. Then every time we collect a new trajectory, it happens under a new different policy. As a result, the, the collection data that we have is much more diverse, which, which leads to better dynamics models and to better learning overall. So this asynchronous learning just not only just let us to train way faster, but also it decreases the sample complexity. 
we finally tested in a similar task that we have before. And on the left, it's the exact same algorithm. One is the synchronous version, and the other one is the synchronous one. And even though both methods, uh, so this is real time. There is no, this is what was actually happening during learning. There is no stopping as in the other video. And we see that just like under 10 minutes, it's able to perform the task. Well, it's synchronous, even though it requires the same amount of interaction with the world, the total training time, it actually takes hours. So we have seen that through model-based RL, meta learning and asynchronous learning you can actually you can actually have real time learning in in robotic systems thank you all right thank you very much uh, so do we have any questions So maybe you said something about this, but, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, how exactly do you improve the policy parameters in these settings? Like what algorithm are you using? Uh, so in this world, we're using uh, MAML, like model agnostic meta learning, right. because we're using meta learning. Uh, but you could use any any kind of uh, meta reinforcement learning algorithm. You could use RL square or, uh -uh. Right. Right, right. or any, yeah. Nice, so it's, it's, it's really mostly <laughs> the way that the whole task is designed is the main contribution, not exactly, you know, the algorithmic components. Yeah, yeah, so the contribution was more the framework and thinking about right. the the learn models as learn simulators in the sense of like, you could just think of it as another instance of dynamics or domain randomization. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. that makes a lot of sense. So any other questions? All right, so in that case, uh, let's uh, thank Ignacia again. And, uh, Well, not so fast, eh? and so there's, a, so there's another talk happening uh, in this session, the last talk in this session. Uh, so as soon as you get back the screen. Uh, so, so our last speaker is uh, Carlos uh, Florenza, who is uh, also from Berkeley, from the same lab as uh, Ignasi. Oh, there we go. And, and he's going to be talking about imitation learning. That's a different title. Okay. Well, I'm curious to find out. Uh, yeah, I've, uh, I'm not presenting, uh, well, Ignazi presented two papers, similarly, I'll also be presenting two papers and uh, combining them in this more general topic, which is going beyond rewards in reinforcement learning uh, with weaker supervision. Um, so let's, let's first start with, well, uh, you just saw in Ignazi's talk that uh, rewards are the workhorse of reinforcement learning. That's how tasks are specified. Um, and that would be the most standard way of, uh, of uh, learning a new policy by specifying uh, what to do but not how to do it and let the algorithm figure it out. But um, there's going to be some shortcomings to rewards and this is what I'm going to try to convince you of. And the alternatives that I'm going to be working with are going to be self-supervision and demonstrations. And those are going to be way cheaper ways of supervision uh, than the other one. So let's delve into why uh, rewards are sometimes tricky to, uh, to work with. First of all, uh, they can lead to undesired behaviors. A uh, simple example would be this uh, that showed, uh, OpenAI showed this uh, game where the point is to have this boat complete a circuit, but because there happens to be some rewards along the way, then it prefers to just turn around here instead of actually completing the race. Uh, so this shows how sometimes uh, engineering rewards is hard. Furthermore, it requires a per, tax, a per task expert knowledge. For example, here we have another robotic system that is trying to insert this ring into this peg uh, with a L2 negative L2 distance to the center of the peg. And it's just like smashing the peg against the side because that's the shortest way of minimizing this distance. An expert will tell you that first you have to go up and then around it. But all this requires expert knowledge that we, we would like not to have to bake into uh, the reward. But rewards are not, are not only hard to engineer, sometimes they're also hard to provide. Specifically, many environments need to be instrumentalized pretty heavily to be able to know what's exactly the state and therefore be able to know, for example, what's the L2, this L2 distance in a more meaningful space. And here we can see some like QR codes applied to these uh, Lego blocks to know if they are stacked or not. Or in the OpenAI hand, there's like uh, mocap markers everywhere to know exactly what's the position of all of this. So the main question is, would it be possible to learn directly from uncalibrated sensor inputs, like just an image? 
Um, so these, to, to tackle this task, I'm going to be talking about this work, self-supervised learning of image embedding for continuous control, a work done at DeepMind. Um, and the main idea is that we would like to have here a robotic system that observes the world, this is OT, the current observation of the world, and we give it a, uh, a goal observation, OG, and our policy, PI, takes actions at every time step, given the current observation, OT, and the goal observation, OG, such that the world ends up in the state that we just gave it. This would be fantastic if we could do this without instrumentalizing the world. Um, so what kind of rewards could we use that do not require a providing system? like, uh, you know, cure markers and these kind of things. First of all, we could simply use an L2 distance in, uh, to the goal in pixel space. But I do not recommend that. It will be extremely noisy and like we all know that two images, uh, I mean, an L2 distance in image space doesn't make much sense. Uh, we could first learn an embedding, collect a few images from the world, learn an embedding, and then have a distance in this uh, uh, embedded space, for example, if we use a VAE or something like that. But that does not convey dynamic information and there's some work that uh, have these shortcomings and therefore states that uh, the VAE might squash together uh, or actually very far apart in the MDP. There's many steps that you need uh, to take from one to the other. Could we use directly the indicator reward, which is actually what we want to optimize, whether at the next observation, OT plus one, we are exactly matching the goal, OG? Well, this is an extremely sparse reward. Like you're never gonna exactly match the observation that it gave you as a, as a goal. This, it will never happen. Like a, imagine like an image and having exactly the same one. This is, this is never going to happen. And if you don't observe a reward ever, you're never going to learn anything. So is this doomed? Well, there's one technique that is called Hinza Experience Replay that is pretty um, adapted for these kind of goal condition settings. And I'm going to represent it here for images. Uh, on the right, we have OG, which is a certain goal image that we give to the system. And on the left, the starting uh, uh, image that is OT. And then we take some action, the robot moves to another position, we have another observation. But because it doesn't match the goal, the reward that we obtain is zero. So we're not learning anything, just that that's not the goal. And then we keep taking actions and we keep moving the robot around, but we never exactly match the goal image. So the reward is always zero and we're not going to learn anything. But what we could do is keep this trajectory that we just collected and instead think that maybe we were attempting another goal. Maybe that trajectory is not good to achieve the goal that we were thinking in the first instance, but maybe if we were trying another goal, for example, the one that we actually reached at the end of the trajectory, this is a perfectly valid trajectory, and we should just have these actions to go to this observation. And then the reward would be one. Therefore, we can basically see as much rewards as we want uh, along our trajectories. And, and the interesting thing that, that we showed with a bunch of other interesting um, uh, additions that I recommend to read the paper for, uh, we managed to learn uh, policies that, given a goal image, are able to go towards uh, that image. The key ideas were no reward learning of visual goal reaching. There was no reward giving system whatsoever. There was no markers anywhere. It's just a camera looking at the robot. Um, some other things that I haven't talked about, but I recommend to read about in this paper. We introduced some structure of the Q function that improves the performance, and we also, also connect uh, the embedding that we learn with model base RL. Um, but altogether, the main limitation of this work is that exploration is still a challenge. Self-supervised methods are um, really powerful because they don't require um, uh, any system to give rewards, but for example, if instead of just reaching a certain point with the arm, if we wanted to manipulate some objects, it will be extremely challenging that the robot just realizes that it can move those objects in a certain way. And for this, I'm going to be introducing another type of supervision, demonstrations. And this is the work um, of goal condition imitation learning that we just presented at NERIPS. The important point here would be that I would like to use suboptimal demonstrations, demonstrations that don't come from an expert. Why? Because there's many uh, ways of giving suboptimal demonstrations that are actually pretty cheap. For example, we could use VR headsets and uh, uh, teleop, like uh, in the video that, that Ignazi showed at the beginning. That was already possible 10 years ago. Uh, more recently, some work from Stanford allows to control a robot with a smartphone and give demonstrations on how to pick objects and place them. Um, so it is pretty, pretty easy to obtain um, a bunch of demonstrations. Once we have demonstrations, what we could do is goal condition imitation learning. And here I have um, put the, what is uh, Gale, Generative Adversarial Imitation Learning, which basically what it does is it looks at some um, demonstrations here in red, 
uh, that have a goal. So all these equations have been modified to also contain G, which is the goal that the demonstrations were conditioned on. Um, and then it distinguishes between those demonstrations and the ones that your current agent is, is collecting. And therefore, your, your agent is encouraged to uh, resemble more and more of the demonstrations. So it's a specific kind of imitation learning. There's many other methods of imitation learning. Um, and you can have other demonstrations that reach other goals. But still, this paradigm that only uses imitation learning is limited. Because it might not generalize to new goals. Imagine that now we're given a goal on the other side, and there was no demonstration that was uh, going to that side. Furthermore, it copies all the inefficiencies that, as I said at the beginning, is something that is inevitable because we want to use uh, suboptimal demonstrations. So the main idea that we uh, propose is to combine demonstrations with self-supervision, everything that I was talking about in the first part of the, of the talk. Uh, so basically, we also maximize the indicator reward of exactly matching the goal that we never observe, but because we use hindsight experience replay, we're able to observe this reward as often as we want. Uh, so these Pictorically, it would be we now collect more demonstration, uh, more more trajectories from the current policy now in black, and maybe they were conditioned on that goal over there, but they did they do not reach the goal, and therefore we relabel them, and now we imagine that oh yeah that's a correct way of reaching that specific goal, and therefore we can uh, self improve this policy beyond the capabilities of the the pure limitation learning method. Um, on top of that, we also propose another. Um, addition, which is relabeling also the expert uh, uh, trajectories, the demonstrations that we have. For example, this would mean that despite, for example, if, if I gave a certain goal to the agent and it didn't actually reach that point, I can still think that if I had given to the agent a point that was reached during the demonstration, well, the expert could as well take that same trajectory to reach that point, and that would be a perfectly valid demonstration. Even more, that demonstration would even be better because it actually reached the goal. So you can also do this for all the states in your demonstrations um, to improve the quality of the demonstration. And we call this expert relabeling. We tested this in a variety of uh, environments, a four-room environment, some pusher tasks, and some like robot stacking tasks. Um, first. Uh, our method in, in blue that we call Goal Gale outperforms doing simply hindsight experience replay, which would be akin to the first work I was presenting uh, in purple. And it also performs a pure limitation learning in gray here, Gale, because it's, it's upper bounded by the quality and the coverage that the demonstrations of the demonstrations that you have. And this is the same for all the other environments. Um, the expert relabeling also enhances, well, behavioral cloning or any kind of imitation learning. Um, for example, in the case of the four-room experiment, because it's a 2D uh, case, I can actually show you how does the coverage, these are the demonstrations that were given to the agent. The agent always starts in the top right corner of the room, and those are demonstrations that it has to reach different points. And by uh, not using uh, expert relabeling, we actually only um, learn a policy that reaches the ends of the trajectory, but not some points in the middle. Whereas if we use expert relabeling, we obviously learn to reach any single point along the demonstrations. Um, Golgate is also more robust to suboptimal demonstrations. Here we need to compare the solid line to the dotted line. We see that Golgale, which is our method, loses only a tiny bit of performance, whereas other, other types of imitation learning lose a lot of performance. Um, and finally, Golgale is able to, for example, do this uh, stacking task, which is pretty challenging, only with 20 demonstrations, um, which is quite easy to provide. Um, so the key ideas to review is um, we use suboptimal demonstration to boost self-supervised methods. And we also use expert relabeling to improve the learning performance and to leverage more of the demonstrations that we had. Some thrilling new directions um, to explore are extending these to third-person imitation and also do it from vision as the first work that I was presenting. And with this, I thank you for your attention. All right, thanks very much for the talk. So, questions? Wave your arms around so that I can see you. My glasses are not here. All right, so, so, so my question here is, uh, that the, so how do you make sure that these two objectives that you're optimizing are not in clash, right? So that they do not go against each other, right? I mean, you can imagine a situation where this hindsight experience replay is actually gonna hurt the expert performance. So like, did you have to face this issue or? Yeah, no, absolutely, that's a very good question. Um, so absolutely, the, if um, uh, the two rewards are just added together, and there's uh, basically, uh, we are annealing the one coming from the demonstration. Because the, 
the reward coming from Hintz Experience Replay is guaranteed to reach full coverage eventually. Um, and this one, so we want to keep the guarantees that come from his experience replay, but, uh, but basically the demonstrations are used to boost the performance at the beginning. So, but we don't want to be hindered by them towards the end. As, as you saw the, the, the slide where I show the results that Gail was actually plateauing is because you don't have that many demonstrations that you're limited by the performance of them. So basically we anneal that reward as the learning proceeds such that you're not limited by that. Yeah, very good question. Right, okay, okay, that makes perfect sense. All right, so anybody else on the questions? Well, I guess that means everybody needs coffee. All right, uh, so let's uh, thank Carlos again. Thank you. And do stick around for after the coffee break.